Today we are going to speak about coaching. So what is coaching in general and uh, what coaching models I worked with and would like to share with you. So what is coaching? Coaching is in most cases assisting a person to come from point A to point B. Professional coaching is about developing per person's skills and knowledge so that their effectiveness at work improves leading to uh, achieving organizational objectives. Coach motivates, supports and encourages person to come from where the person is to where he would like to be. For instance, if a person would like to, to get some new facilitation skills or soft skills, a coach can work, to, work out an approach to help a person to get these skills and what is more important to provide a person some mechanism so next time a coachee, the person who is being coached, can do it by himself to obtain some new qualities. So coaching in most cases is about teaching a person how to fish other than giving him a fish every time. So what is not coaching? Coaching is not therapy. Coaching does not focus on past, heal emotional wounds or soothe symptoms. A coach assumes that a coachee is qualified to work with the coach and to develop his skills based on a coachee beliefs and values. Coaching is not consulting. Um, unlike a consultant who is hired to provide particular answers, coach cannot have cannot know all answers and cannot solve all problems. Um, a coach in most cases can challenge a coachee, make some actions towards the goals, but a coach doesn't, ta doesn't tell a coachee particular what to do. A coaching is not friendship. Similar to a friend, a coach can provide basic support and encouragement but also a coach teaches a coachee specific skills and knowledge. Who of you have ever been coached? Who of you is doing coaching? Okay. I would like to ask you during my session to think about what models works for you when you have been coaching people and compare it to the models that I am discussing. And also, who is being coached of you, I would like to ask you to recall sessions that you liked, that you had with your coach, and to think about how it to be coached with the models that I am providing today. So, the first model I would like to talk about is Tigro model. It is a very simple model, but it is an interesting model to set format of the discussion and to define goals for the discussion. In this model, T stands for topic. So usually when our coach comes, we would like to set up some context and some, some topic to speak about. Goal stands for goal. And during this part of, of conversation, we are discussing what goals have coach in mind to talk about, what goals he is aiming to. Then we define the reality. It is where we are now, comparing to the goals we would like to be. Then we need to list options that can help us to reach the goal from reality. And then we should convert these options into action items, a particular items that we should do to reach our goal. Further a bit, I will describe how this model works in practice. Um, but for now, I would like to describe one more model that works very well with this one. And it is SMART. Probably most of you know this model. It is very good and it is very convenient to work with goals when it is, smart, when it is stated in SMART format, when the goal is specific. So we don't talk about that we would like that everything is good. We would like to know what specifically should be good, what, what means good. We would like the goal is measurable, so we can apply some statistics to the, to the model. To, we would like to apply some statistics 
and some measurements to the goal when it is achieved and to understand whether we achieve it or not. So the goal should be measurable. The goal should be achievable. It should be, we should be capable to achieve the goal. The goal should be relevant for our situation, for the coachee, for the project or the program we are working with. And the goal should be time boxed. So we are, we are telling the coachee that we are going to measure our results during, for instance, several months or several weeks. <coughs> Actually, what, what I also like to mention is when you're working with someone as a coach, sometimes you need to describe a person the models you're working with. You need to say him or her that here is the model and we would like to use this model for our coaching session. But sometimes you don't need to do this. Uh, there are people who are mostly uh, interested in results and they absolutely don't care about what you're going to do with them. And there are people who are very interested in the particular steps that you're going to do with him, with him or her. So then you need to describe the model that it is Tigro or the goal, let's discuss it in smart format. So also keep it in mind when doing coaching. By the way, you probably don't need to write lots of notes because I have um, coaching canvases and most of information is in these canvases from presentation. So you can take it from me after the session. So I used Tigro model together with Smart model to coach a person, to coach a Scrum master who faced a problem when Retra event hasn't, when Retro event was not attended by all the team, when team members keep sp skipping the Retro. So we decided with Scrum Master to format our conversation with Tigro and with uh, Smart Models. The topic of our discussion was a Retro that it is not attended by some team members. Um, the goal was to have a Retro that is attended by the whole team, or it is by 90% of the team. The reality was that only half of the team was participated in Retro. Um, the, they have several options to discuss. For instance, we have an option to describe Retro aim to participants once again, because probably people don't understand what is this event is about. It can happen when new people come to Scrum team, sometimes they're not sure why they should go somewhere. We also have an option to have retro surgery. It is retro on retro. So to discuss with teams why we need the retro and why some people don't want to attend the retro. We also have an option to actually escalate the problem to manager. It is not an agile way to do things, but sometimes it can work and should be considered. Uh, we also have an option to bring some juice and pizza to Retro, just to make it more informal <laughs> and appeal people with pizza. <laughs> we discussed all of these options and several others, and we stayed on, we created action items, and we decided that on a day when the Retro should happen, during a daily stand-up, actually after it, a Scrum Master should communicate a Retro goal once again to a team, also, Scrum Master should invite people to the Retro and to suggest them just to try a new Retro format. So we are not going to discuss on this Retro what is good and what is bad. <laughs> so we have new format. There are lots of them and maybe some of them would like to take part. And also, yes, we decided to bring pizza and juice from program budget. We did all this stuff and we get, we got most of the people coming to Retro. And we measured our goals during four sprints. And what, what I see now is that 90% of the sprint visiting Retro, there is only one person who continues to skip it, but it is, even, it is still good because uh, we, at first we only have half of the team participating in Retro. And actually this team has set up uh, to have some parties uh, after the Retro. And the last initiative was a cognac party. <laughs> so they used to spend time all together. So 
probably you can use these models for set up in some conversations with your Scrum Masters or your Agile team members in this way, and probably you can also get good results. So you can try. During our conversation with Scrum Master, I tried not to influence him with my own experience. I, not try, I try not to translate him my beliefs or my values. I try to ask him and give him a possibility to find a way out by himself, just by asking. For this, I used powerful questions and open questions. Open questions is questions that does not um, require yes or no answer. Open questions help to widen the conversation. And powerful questions is the questions that challenge a person's way of thinking. For instance, if the person tends to go only, to think only about how it will be good when I get something, how it will be good when I get my goal, and the coach try to evaluate the risks, the conversation can fail because they're moving in different directions. And I have this grouping approach for questions. I called it seasons, but you can have your own. For me, it is very important to bring the coachee to different situations. Because I know that for myself, it is very interesting. I'm always asking people why question. So I start observing myself, and I start understanding that I'm asking questions, I'm asking people one and the same questions. So I used some categorizations of questions, and when I'm talking to people, I try to bring them in all these directions. One more model that I would like to speak about is, by the way, who of you probably have already seen some applications of powerful questions, Tigro, and smart model on your projects? <laughs> okay. One more model that I like to work with is neurological levels integration. Who is you familiar with this model? <coughs> Who of you is using it on, on practice with coaching? Mm -hmm. I see. So this model is perfectly well when the final destination, like point B, is not clear for a coachee. When a coachee feels something discomfortable about the situation, but he doesn't know what exactly should happen to, to feel better. So this model is about investigation. And to start with, we should investigate the environment where we are. I use this model in most of the cases for career development of people. When we're starting coaching sessions and I'm understanding that the person probably doesn't feel okay with maybe scrum changes, maybe agile transformation, maybe something wrong with his relations with team members or his managers, and we try trying to investigate what, what is the, the problem, where it is. This exercise usually consists of three steps. During the first step, we investigate the current position of the person. During the second step, we investigate where the person would like to be and then compare these two positions. So we start with environment, and good questions on this level is who, with whom, when, and where. For instance, please describe me your environment, your, sur your surroundings. Okay, and the person starting describing it, and can you answer me a question? What people are around you? Also, when I ask him this question, I try to I try to understand what person sees, what person hears, and what person feels in his environment. For instance, what do you feel when you're interacting with these people? Or what do you see when you sit on your table where you're sitting? And actually, the problem can be found out even, even on this very first environment. Maybe something is wrong with it. The second level of investigation is behavior. And the right question here is to ask, what do you do at your work? What do you do at your environment? And what other people are doing at your environment? And what do you feel when people are doing this stuff? And next level is competence and skills of the person. What helps you to do the, what you are doing? What uh, competence you have to do what you are doing? and what skills you value in people that are around you. 
when you do this exercise, you also try to link the next level with the previous one, to integrate it. So when I'm asking about competence, I remember about behavior, that some competence help a person to, to do some behavior. And probably it has, has also a representation in environment. The next level is values and beliefs. So um, why do you think, here is why questions, why do you think that this competence helps you? Why do you value something in people? Why do you value these qualities of your manager? And we investigate this level. The higher level is identity, it is self-identification. Here is question, who is the person with such environment, behavior, competence, values and beliefs? How can you call this person? And the person can answer, okay, I feel I'm a professional or I'm a good specialist. So here is, I would like some, the person to uh, say me some, something about himself, how he can describe himself. The next level is purpose or mission. It is higher than self-identity. It is something the person is belongs to. And here I can ask, what inspire you at work? What is your mission at work? And when I do, when I go level by level by level, I also ask person to provide me some metaphors to get a unified vision of each level. For instance, when I'm asking about environment, I can say, please describe me your environment in one word or phrase. And the person can say, well, I feel it is like a road in a rush hour. And about behavior, how do you feel at your current work? Like a fish in water. Very skillful, know exactly what to do at, at each state. When the first part is over, we start talking about desired, uh, desired states with the person. And we're going from top to bottom. We start with mission. What mission would you like to have? What, um, how do you would like to call yourself? And below and below, what values probably you would like to get? or you would like to, to see in people around you. And then you have like answers about what is and what is necessary, and you can compare it. Sometimes you can create a matrix on it, but actually you don't need it, because during this investigation, the person can say, wow, I know, that's about this or that's about that. I had it with a girl, and when we came to competence and behavior, when coming from top to bottom, she said, oh, I see it now. I need more direct communications with clients, and I need more responsibility. Yeah, that's it. So this, this is very helpful when the final answer is not clear, the final B destination when your question is not clear. Also, I do this exercise as a body game. I ask a person to write on a list of paper these levels. For instance, environment, behavior, one per each. And then we put it on the floor, like this. And when we are doing, we are moving. It helps to live through, live through our environment or behavior. Because we are creating like space anchors. And it separates each level from each level, physical separation. And then we're coming back of it. So it I saw that it helps better, it, that it works better than just talking. <coughs> also, you can do this exercise, for instance, with a newly created team. When you are just creating a team, agile team, for Scrum uh, framework implementation, you can ask team members what you, environment you would like to create. What behavior will be valued by all the team members of this team? What skills will be necessary for this team? What values will be appreciated in this team? How do you call the people in this team? And what will be the mission of your team, actually? So you can do it for teams and you can... This pyramid is good also for companies' creations or some business owners who would like to identify the mission of their company, what people should be in this company, what values, what competence, behavior and environment. So, as I already mentioned, I did it with a girl who actually she would like to leave our company 
because she felt not a care at her current position and we did this stuff with her. And we understood that skills, she need more um, responsibility and higher area of influence. And she also would like more direct communications with client. And after this uh, coaching session, she decided to take part in Luxoft Mobility program and find another project. So she stayed within company and just changed the project. That is good because her expert expertise remains in the company. Now I'd like to talk a bit about coaching Scrum Master's process in Luxoft. Who of you is familiar with this model? Okay, so I will describe it just a bit. It is a Japanese uh, martial art concept about learning to mastery. On a shoe level, um, it is translated like obey and protect. On a shoe level, a coachee is obeyed by teaching and protected by teaching. And here is the basics uh, techniques are learned. On high level, on high level, it is translated like detached, and a person start copying from master lots of uh, techniques without modifications. It's just about copying. And on real level, a coachee is no longer a coachee, but a pioneering, pra pioneering <laughs> practitioner. A coachee should, on this level, think originally and create his own techniques. So on Luxoft, uh, we usually use this model to teach Scrum Masters, and on shoe level, a coach works together with Scrum Master. A, scr a coach uh, with Scrum Master prepares, all, prepares for all Scrum events all together, and then a coach conducts these events, and Scrum Master observes the events, and then we retrospect on the event. Also, on shoe level, we create very particular lists of Scrum Master activities, and when we are coming to high level, a coach provides a Scrum Master possibility to facilitate meetings by himself, but a coach presents on meetings and then also provides feedback. And also we're gathering feedback from team members to understand that we're moving on the right direction. And on real level, a coach leaves the project and can be only involved in some activities which Scrum Master thinks are necessary or when some expert advice is needed. So Scrum Master came, come to a coach to ask some particular questions and then implement it by himself within Scrum team. When doing agile transformations from time to time, or when doing Scrum processes set up, from time to time I'm facing several barriers. And the first barrier is lack of understanding or misunderstanding about the purpose of coaching. Sometimes when I work with program managers or project managers, I see that the, the people don't understand what we're going to do. And in this case, I would like to spend nearly a month to collect and gather all the necessary information for me. Because better to lose this one month than to lose several months for activities that are not, not necessary for a program or project. One more barrier is coaching is considered an inter intervention and inter interruption from main work. A common excuse, I have no time, is actually can be a reflection of coaching low priority. So this case can happen when team members are usually rushing from one crisis to another and are occupied in firefighting. When I do scrum processes set up, I try to explain the manager that it is not a crisis management activity and when the project is in red area, scrum probably will not work in this situation and scrum framework is not crisis management tool. So this is the very, the very commonly um, the, mo the most commonly faced by me barrier, this one. When coaching is provided to a person who does not have any rights but only obligations, this person, for instance, a, a scrum master, can hardly be able to advise people and to lead further agile transformation. When coaching is used as quick fix, quick fixing works only for a short period of time. 
while coaching can provide a long-term solutions. And coaching also can provide a mechanism for problems identification and problem solving. Coaching calls for sustainable efforts and time. So in this case, proper time should be allocated for project, for coaching. Uh, coaching is used to compensate lack of leadership and motivation. Scrum, in most cases, should be based on these qualities. And sometimes understanding of Scrum does not bring brings it automatically to the team. It can even, um, it can even identify its lack of its, these qualities when you're bring, bringing Scrum into teams. And it is also wrong to think that what works with a person in one situation can be applied to a new person or can be applied to a similar situation. So there is no such coaching style that will be possible to do in all situations with all people. I also would like to talk about states that despite from barriers, motivates a coach and can keep a coach in a good position. These states, seven C's of successful coaching, are worked out by <laughs> business coach Richard Wilfield, and I find it quite um, helpful in my daily work. Connection. It is crucially important to build a rapport with a coachee. So if coachee trusts you and you can trust a coachee. So you both perceive information similarly. Caring. It is good when a coach cares about person and cares about the outcomes of the person and, and see some vision of these outcomes as well as steps to achieve these outcomes. Clarity. It is good when coach see what exactly was done already and what we are going to do. So what is left. It is nice to, to feel and show real interest in a coachy, in a coachy results and in coachy obstacles, the obstacles the coachy is facing. And to question the coachy, what is holding you back and what we can do about it. A coach can from time to time to challenge a coachy, a coachy way of thinking and especially a negative one. We should challenge uh, restrictions and limitations of the coachy and to teach a coachee to think wider. For instance, a scrum master can think that a team can't work without a manager or without administration. And we should shake a bit this um, belief. And there are several models for this, for beliefs shaking, beliefs shifting. We should also be confident in coachee. Only in this way we can encourage him or her to take risks and to do changes. Because if you don't believe, it is not like true to, do, to make a person to do something if you don't believe in success. And both coach and kachi should be committed to the results and to do their best to achieve it. Before we come to question answering session, I would like to suggest that some of you who really need coaching session, for instance, based on Deals Pyramid, can catch me on the session and I can do a coaching session with you. So that's it, and please questions.